Good evening, everyone, and welcome back to Empty Cloud Monastery. So we're here this evening with our beloved bhikkhuni, Aya Soma, uh, and our less beloved bhikkhu, Bhante Sudaso. <laughs> I don't know about the less Bhante, that we disagree. <laughs> um, so uh, this is our weekly monk chat session. So this is your opportunity to ask any questions you have that are at least somewhat related to Buddhism. Uh, and as long as it's not completely out of the domain of Buddhism, we'll do our best to give some kind of answers. Uh, so I see many questions already, which is wonderful. So it's really delightful to see questions already waiting for us. So maybe we can just launch right in. Do you want to um, choose the questions? Or do you want me okay, to do go it? in the order. OK. Yeah. So first question, uh, Jojo says, it has been addressed by some of you that killing insects and pests violates the first precept. Do you have any tips for lay people to keep pests without spraying pesticides? How do Buddhist countries or Buddhist people deal with this? Do they just roam free, or is there some foolproof, violence-free tricks I don't know about? I'd like to have a house free of pests without killing them. Can I have the best of both worlds? <laughs> I think this is a great question for you. I would say yes and no, <laughs> first of all. Uh, you can have <clears throat> the best of not killing. <laughs> and... Um, Actually, the practice of not killing also makes us understand how strong our impulse to kill, how strong it's present in the mind and how strong actually we go towards it as our first resort. And also how unnecessary most of the times um, it is, because actually most of the pests that we perceive as pests are just a nuisance more than um, actually a health concern most of them like for example one of my favorite stories that if you've been hanging out on our channel for a while you've probably heard numerous times but i'm going to share it again <laughs> <clears throat> at our old um, retreat center in new york city we had an infestation of ants and um pretty much everyone who would come to the to the center um who was not born buddhist <laughs> <clears throat> or who was living at the center and was not a monastic, myself included, at the, at the very beginning, I was a lay person who was not born Buddhist, um, were reacting really poorly uh, towards these um, ants because they were going everywhere, uh, even in the shower. Like, even when one was taking a shower, apparently um, so there is some shampoo, some uh, different um, bathing things that have a sweet taste so ants are attracted to to sugar <laughs> to anything sweet so they would go everywhere and it was kind of like a nightmare and i'm saying kind of uh because it wasn't really a nightmare it was a nightmare in terms of how we were experiencing it um but in reality actually when you think about it um and when you actually look at the even the data ants are really not that much of a threat for sentient beings, <laughs> for human beings. Um, so we can actually coexist with ants if we want to. But if we want to actually, if we desire to have, as you said, if I'd like to have a house free of pests, well, the cause of suffering is desire right there. <laughs> so I had that type of suffering for actually quite a few years when we first started the retreat center because my desire was for the house there to be free of ants. And it was impossible, basically, <clears throat> because they had been living there a long, lot longer than I had. As Bhante Sumita actually once said, you know, usually when we purchase houses, uh, or when we rent houses, you know, we have a like financial transaction with someone. So we pay money to either the owner or the landlord. But we never actually have that transaction with insects, for example, <laughs> who have been living there for quite a long time or any kind of animal, really. So we just expect them. We're like, this is my property. But we don't understand that that is actually their property, too. So I would say that um, the appropriate response is, well, first and foremost, understand that a lot of this suffering is self-inflicted and then actually find some nice ways to repel them, to repel the insects. So, so basically, instead of 
um, thinking that they will disappear magically overnight. Instead, maybe we can relocate them to a certain part of the property. <laughs> or we can um, invite them out of certain parts of our property, maybe, right? Um, and so there's lots of different ways if, that you can Google how to repel ants, for example, or how to repel all sorts of different sentient beings. And um, in that way, we practice non-harming. And the practice of non-harming then creates the, a mind of compassion and a mind of metta. And we're happy. They're happy. Probably they'll stop bothering us as much. Actually, now, whenever I see ants, I'm really happy to see them because they taught me so much. And Charles Lee asks, uh, is it possible and is there any benefit to directing metta towards an inanimate object, such as a cup, a house, or a sweatshirt, or towards an idea, such as justice, education, or democracy? So metta, uh, fundamentally metta is the wish for sentient beings to be happy. Uh, so this is not um, something that can be directed towards a non-sentient being. Uh, towards inanimate objects, um, then you can have a mind of equanimity, a mind of acceptance. Uh, you can cultivate a mind of appreciation, uh, of tolerance. Uh, you can uh, have many wholesome mind states towards inanimate objects. Um, but I, I actually would say that metta is, is not one of them. Uh, metta is wishing for a sentient being to be happy. Uh, and optimally wishing for all sentient beings to be happy um, indiscriminately. Um, so, so actually, I would say that no, you can't have metta for inanimate objects. But it is very important to have um, acceptance, tolerance, equanimity, and appreciation for inanimate objects. Um, and as for ideas, um, actually, with ideas, I think it's important to apply wisdom to identify the wholesome components and the unwholesome components. So uh, again, you mentioned, for example, democracy. Well, democracy has wholesome components and unwholesome components. So have the wisdom to identify which is which. Uh, so yeah, it's, uh, yeah, I would say metta is, is not the right, the right application here, but there are other wholesome mind states that are relevant. Do you have any thoughts on this? I think that's pretty far. Okay. <clears throat> And um, Kumu also has great suggestions. <laughs> so, well, we answered it already, but maybe mm -hmm. Bhante, do you want to give some other? Yeah, so Kumu says, I use mechanical methods like barriers, nets, and repellents like garlic. Uh, also have a separate plot for the pest to come and feed as much as they want. Yeah, those are those are some examples of nonviolent ways of, of dealing with pests. Um, Another one is just uh, figure out why they're coming into your house in the first place. So the reason why the ants were coming around is because uh, we weren't cleaning the kitchen particularly well. So it actually taught us the importance of keeping the kitchen extremely clean. If you keep everything extremely clean, then uh, things like ants and cockroaches just won't really have any interest in hanging out in your house. They'll go somewhere else. And Anonymous asks, monastics can only eat what is offered. Do water, juices, tea, and allowables have to be offered as well? <clears throat> yes, everything except for water. Yeah, so water is, uh, there's actually two things which we can um, ingest without them being offered. Uh, so water and tooth cleaning sticks, um, which in many monasteries is interpreted to also include toothpaste. Um, so the, at the time of the Buddha, and actually still to this day in, in many parts of the world, um, there are certain kinds of uh, plants which can be used as natural mm, tooth cleaning supplies. Uh, so technically those don't have to be offered. You can just go out in the forest and pick it up off the, the forest floor. Uh, and of course water, if you, you can always consume water whether it's offered or not. But uh, everything else has to be offered. So let's see the next question. Um, 
And great to see you all, friends, uh, from Seattle, from Florida, from who knows where. <laughs> and Thinnery. Oh, thin Hello, thin good to see you. So uh, Robert asks, um, I plan to observe the Oposita precepts for at least the first week of Asa. I've never done so for longer than a day and would appreciate any advice you can offer. What are your thoughts? Well, that is a great idea, Robert. So, Asa, <laughs> do. Um, yeah. Um, advice is just watch your mind. Uh, probably all your defilements are going to explode right in that moment. <laughs> At least that was for me uh, when I first uh, started practicing. Well, actually, even the five precepts, really, when I uh, took them seriously, it was um, it was very difficult. And whenever I upped them up, <laughs> I added some more precepts, then Mara just always came um, to assault me. So stick with it, observe the mind, and take it as a um, a great opportunity to familiarize yourself with the mind. So for example, at the very beginning, when I took the eight precepts, I remember I hated every single allowable that was allowed. And at the very beginning, I was really convinced, for example, you know, that I really hated cheese. Um, but then I was like, wait, I only hate cheese um, in the afternoon. <laughs> in the morning, actually, it's completely fine. Or I really hate ginger in the afternoon, but in the morning, it's completely fine. Why is that so? Um, so for me, it was more that um, essentially my craving was looking for... Um, yeah, an object to to stick on. And it was um, just being averse to, to the experience that was there. So sometimes it's not really true what our mind, actually not sometimes, most of the time, <laughs> whatever our, our mind is telling us. Um, I think it was your Zen teacher that was saying, uh, just look at the mind and say, liar. <laughs> oh, that was Ajahn Chah. Oh, it was Ajahn Chah. Okay, yeah. there you go. Well, teacher of your teacher then. <laughs> and... Um, yeah, so really taking that approach to heart of really looking at the mind and understanding that all of these defilements are not really who we are, but they are temporary um, phenomena in the mind. Um, but we can learn from them a lot. And we can, once we learn from them, they stop having, they stop controlling us. They stop having a hold on us. And then we can let go of them. And we can be, oh, okay, yeah, well... If there's cheese or no cheese, or if there is ginger or no ginger, if there's juice or no juice, um, anything is fine. It's okay. And Samrit asks, how to deal with cunning and shrewd people, like auto sales people, who try to befool you and squeeze money out of you, and it invokes anger, and it's hard to not react and confront them. Uh, well, first off, uh, have some compassion for them. Uh, recognize that they're just trying to make a living uh, and their occupation is one which is actually it's about trying to get the most money out of the person that's that's buying their product so yeah it's it's uncomfortable to be involved in in haggling um, it's actually it's one of the great things about being a monk who doesn't use money I don't don't have to worry about haggling um, it's uncomfortable, but acknowledge that the other person is, they're just trying to make a living. They're trying to get by uh, in this world. Uh, and uh, and if you notice that you, you really can't control the anger, so you try to produce compassion, you try to produce metta, you try to produce tolerance, but it's just really not working, then, then actually it's better to avoid those situations if you can. Uh, just try to stay away from the situations that are too challenging for you. And in the meantime, do a lot of metta meditation. Uh, and then maybe in a couple of years, um, you'll be better able to, to face those kinds of situations. And we have some feedback that there might be some problem with the sound. So I'm mm -hmm. not sure if people can hear us. Yeah, so if anybody else is having trouble with the sound, please let us know. Because on, on our end, it seems to be working. Then Kumu has a question. Uh, can one bhikkhu or bhikkhuni offer another venerable food or a beverage like tea? What if there is no lay person to offer food or tea in a monastery? 
no, that doesn't. That's actually specifically a rule <laughs> that we can't accept it from another monastic unless it has been previously offered to that monastic, of course. So once the offering is made to the Sangha, um, then anyone, um, anyone in the Sangha can actually accept the offering. Um, but if it hasn't been offered, then nobody can actually partake in the in that which is not offered. And if there is no lay person to offer food, tea in a monastery, well, it's a great opportunity to practice the joy of missing out. Um, so it has happened to us in the past, and we're like, okay, well, there's the actually sometimes the monastery would be full of food, and we're like, well, <laughs> it can't be offered. I mean, it's nice decoration, but <laughs> that's about it. Um, so yeah, it's a great practice of um, renunciation of joy. Yeah, and, and of course, uh, one can always fall back on the, the basic support for a monk, which is to go alms round. Mm -hmm. um, as tomorrow, we're going alms round in uh, Montclair, so the town next to the monastery. And Charles, he asks, why do Theravada monastics shave their heads? So it's actually uh, universal throughout the Buddhist world. So in every Buddhist tradition, uh, bhikkhus and bhikkhunis shave their heads. Uh, and there's many reasons for this. Um, one of the main reasons is that it, uh, at the time of, of the Buddha, uh, everyone had hair. The only people who shaved their heads, uh, and actually it wasn't voluntary, um, were criminals and outcasts. So if you committed a major crime, then one of the punishments was that your head would be shaved. So it wasn't something that you would do voluntarily. Uh, and it was a mark of shame. It was a mark that you had done something um, so antisocial that society had, had decided to make an example of you by cutting off all your hair. So then to deliberately cut off your own hair was a sign that you were rejecting the ordinary values and um, goals of society, that you were choosing to deliberately place yourself outside of, of normal society. So it was actually a very strong social statement to cut off all your hair. Uh, it's also uh, an act of, of renunciation, of simplicity. Um, so uh, I remember when I had long hair, I actually spent a lot of time and effort taking care of it. Uh, now, I just, every few days, I take a razor blade, and in about five minutes, all my hair is gone. So it's much quicker and easier. Um, and uh, another thing is that it uh, marks us clearly as Buddhist monks. So you'll notice that Ayasoma and I, we both have exactly the same haircut and exactly the same clothing. So this is uh, one of the ways that we let go of our, our sense of identity. Uh, so often people place a lot of self-identity in their hairstyle. Um, what shape and color and, and style that they do with their hair is, is an expression of me and who I am. So in cutting off all your hair and putting on exactly the same clothes as all the other Buddhist monks, you're making it clear that it, you're not anyone in particular. You're just another monk. Um, and actually, there's even no gender distinction to be clearly seen. So whether someone is male or female, when they join the monastic order, they have the same outfit and the same haircut. So we all look the same. Okay. And Samrate has another question. How to differentiate between chanda and desire as, as it is difficult to live without some goals in life? Is having wholesome desire to accumulate good common merits also a cause of suffering? I would say that um well the desire to accumulate good karma and merits um, is the desire that brings to the end of desire um so to get to your first question yes of course we need some motivation um in order to attain any type of goal so that's why actually you know one of the um uh, on the, one of the components of the Noble Eightfold Path is effort, but very important, right effort. <laughs> and what does it, the, you know, there's lots of different things that we can put effort uh, into doing 
And a lot of the time it's actually wrong effort because in fact it is um, um, motivated by greed, hatred and delusion. So by defilements. But instead, right effort is actually motivated by this, um, um, by uh, sila, samadhi and panya, essentially. <laughs> and so that brings to the cessation of suffering. And so we want to uh, try to really get some other type of motivation that is not greed, that is not accumulation, or rather it's renunciation. Um, so why do we want to do, why do we want that promotion? Usually the promotion in, in the office or work or whatever, we want it because um, there's lots of different kind of unwholesome reasons. Maybe we want to feel superior uh, than others. We want to, um, you know, make more, accumulate more, et cetera, et cetera. But instead what we can go is like, oh, well, how about that promotion? Actually, if I get more responsibilities, I can actually use um, those responsibilities, that sort of power that comes from that role to help others, um, to make more, to have more decision, more say, say, for example, in the, um, if we're working in research um, for, I don't know, science, um, making medicine that will cure people. Well, I can uh, put more effort. Um, I can have, I can also like, help others um, achieve the same goal. So essentially, what is our motivation there? It's compassion, it's something wholesome. Um, it's caring for others, it's gentleness and, and so forth. So always checking what our intention is. And maybe, you know, it will result in the same sort of accomplishment from the outside world in the way of that it's, uh, say, a promotion at work. But the implications, the results of that action will have will will bring us towards the cessation of suffering rather than um towards the increase of suffering you know not but it has any other that's good yeah. and rick asks what are skillful means when one has a particularly strong craving that continues to cause suffering despite years of dedicated practice well it depends upon the specific craving uh, but generally speaking, some things which help a lot is uh, first off to deliberately isolate yourself from the object of your craving for a long period of time. Um, so it um, depends again on, on exactly what your object of craving is, but find a way to put it completely out of your reach for uh, a week or a month or three months or, or even longer. Um, so complete separation from it for an extended period of time can help quite a bit. Uh, uh, actively cultivating the opposite, uh, whatever the opposite might be in this case. Um, another thing which really helps is to just pay attention to how unpleasant the craving itself is. Uh, and by contrast, how peaceful a mind free of craving is. Uh, these are things which can can help um but yeah it, it really depends upon the specific kind of craving that you're dealing with otherwise i can only give pretty generalized answers and cindy has a question for ayasoma uh, what are some of the challenges you experience as a female monastic and how do you overcome them <laughs> mm. well there are actually quite a few. <laughs> and um, what are some? Hmm. Well, uh, some of them are, for example, when someone does a lot of work, um, but if there is um, another male in the picture, then the male gets the credit of your work. <laughs> that can be a very challenging experience um, because there is actually a lot of ego uh, in there. So in that situation, at the very beginning, I was um, extremely um, shocked, extremely like I was not used to it because I was coming to a field where gender wasn't really, or sex actually wasn't really, both sex and gender weren't really like um, uh, a factor that was um, very salient when one was giving credit of, you know about 
anything that one was doing. Um, so at the very beginning, I was very perplexed. <laughs> and uh, these days, well, it happens significantly less perhaps than uh, when we when I first kind of entered the path. Um, but yeah, I always recollect the Dhamma. Uh, I recollect um, the teachings of the Buddha, where it says praise, honor, gain, bitter, vile, obstructive to awakening. So then I go like, oh, that's great. <laughs> um, no praise or very little praise or very little gain or no gain at all. Um, that's wonderful. Why did I ordain? Definitely not to get praise, gain, um, or honor. I would have just stayed in the field where I was in fashion. It was a lot more fun <laughs> to get praise, um, gain, honor. But of course, you know, um, in the path when we're human and um, the defilements come up, so it can be a little bit challenging. Um, especially when, aside from the credit, it can become disrespect, actually. Um, and, you know, when uh, one is around other, um, you know, other monastics that look in a different way and they have a different treatment or they're placed in a different um, sort of, I'm being really honest, you know, <laughs> etc. So when there is that blatant different treatment, it can be very upsetting and it can have actually in the past, it has really shaken my, my faith in Buddha, Dhamma and Sangha. And that becomes very problematic um, because sometimes, um, yeah, we can take everything as the whole sort of cake um, and go, okay, well, actually these are the teachings of the Buddha and um, I'm being discriminated here. So do I actually want to be discriminated by the, the teachings of the Buddha? Maybe not. So I'll just, uh, throw out everything. And that's how do I cope with that is, um, or how I have, because actually that, I think I don't have that problem anymore, at least these days. But anyway, the, mm, how I overcame them was to really study the Dhamma and understand what are the teachings of the Buddha. And then understand that in certain places, you will find some teachings of the Buddha that are actually practiced and some others that are not. And it's just part of, you know, the path of each one of us. So sometimes we're practicing well, sometimes we're not practicing well. And then understanding that um, our commitment is not towards one particular lineage or one particular tradition um, or one particular way of doing things, but our commitment, um, we take refuge in Buddha, Dhamma, and Sangha. So we take refuge in the original teacher. Shakyamuni Buddha. And so it's our duty to understand what is really to investigate that, um, what is what is actually the teachings of the Buddha. And so when it comes to discrimination, uh, it just has no place within Buddhism. Um, and, you know, we can't say that everything is impermanent and no self, um, except for a body, <laughs> except for uh, gender, except for, you know, one particular like genitalia, etc. No, it's all over the canon, you know, in the Vasetta Sutta, for example, the, the Buddha is extremely explicit that there's nothing that, um, you know, is, is truly makes a difference in terms of physical connotations. So here, these are a few challenges, but I can write a book about them. <laughs> Okay. And Anthony asks, sometimes when I go about my day, especially when going out for walks, I try to practice mindfulness. I find that my attention goes everywhere. There is so much going on in the outside world. How does one be mindful in day-to-day -day life? What does one focus on mainly? Well, actually, one thing that's really helpful is to focus on your feet. So practicing mindfulness of feet uh, as you go throughout your day. Uh, that's a, a very potent way of staying focused. Uh, more generalized awareness of the movements of mind can also be relevant. If your mind is moving around a lot, well, then watch as it moves around a lot. Uh, so it's not particularly peaceful, uh, but you can develop uh, a certain detached wisdom uh, that comes through observing the movements of mind and the reactivity of mind. I will say recommend mindfulness of feet. That tends to, tends to be pretty effective. Do you have any other recommendations? No, I think that's pretty good. And Rick asks, what is the difference between having a strong craving versus having an addiction? Mm. Mm. I would say that 
strong craving is something that we can, um, with difficulty, uh, let go. Um, an addiction is something that we have to put considerably more work. So it's basically a strong craving that has not been controlled and has got gotten to the point where it's chronic. Um, so it's no different than having, you know, any, it's basically the difference between having a headache and a chronic headache, or the difference between having um, a problem with the liver, you know, the, the liver got sick, or having a chronic liver disease. So, um, yeah, we can see it when it comes to the body, we can understand how one is eat more easily controlled, curable rather than controlled than the other. Um, but both of them are possibly reversible, if not in this life, maybe in future lives. And Samri asks, how to strike a balance between solitude and socializing? As sometimes too much solitude can be very challenging and one needs voice and physical company of others to uplift oneself in difficult times. Well, uh, you're not necessarily asking the best person because I actually really love solitude. Uh, I actually really like being by myself. I, I think I'm my favorite company. Uh, I always get along really well with myself. <laughs> Um, so, uh, actually it's been a little while since I did a personal retreat, but it was, it was delightful just being completely by myself for a couple of weeks and zero contact with anyone. It was, it was wonderful. Um, so actually first off I recommend learn how to be okay with solitude. Uh, so what's going on when you're alone? It's just you with yourself. So what's the problem? Uh, so maybe you have a craving for companionship. You have a craving for company of others. Uh, or maybe you're just really bored and you're seeking stimulation or entertainment. Well, do some meditation, do some chanting, study the suttas, go for a long walk. Uh, and try to learn how to be okay with being alone. Uh, and then similarly, when, when you're with others, you're practicing metta, uh, learning how to be okay when you're with others. Uh, but not letting yourself get swept away by the torrent of personalities and emotions and ideas uh, when, when you're with others. Uh, and in difficult times uh, to uplift yourself, well, again, I recommend metta meditation. I recommend reading the suttas. I recommend chanting. Uh, these are all things which, which can bring a lot of happiness to the mind. And Jason asks, is it considered appropriate for a lay person to teach Dhamma? Um, it depends on the intention. And I think that actually is the same answer also for the monastics. <laughs> for anyone to teach Dhamma. So since the time of the Buddha, there were both um, monastics and lay people teaching the Dhamma. Um, but what is our intention? And also what is the result also in the mind? So if we feel, we start feeling conceited, for example, oh, why no better than... Uh, <laughs> And those monastics there, even though I'm a lay person, and then we start distorting the Dhamma and saying that actually certain precepts are not necessary, etc. When that is not, um, it's not a really wholesome intention and actually has really bad results. And it's also a Dhamma. Um, but if we see like, for example, in the... Um, in, in the suttas, uh, if I remember correctly, it's Uga the householder, but there's also some others. But anyway, Uga the householder, um, it's one of these uh, beautiful suttas. He's a um, um, non-returner um, and he um, declares his incredible qualities of mind. And one of them is actually that um, whenever he sees monastics, for example, um, well, first of all, actually two qualities. One quality is that whenever he sees monastics, like either he knows because he can read their minds or some devas come and tell him, oh, that that monastic is virtuous, that monastic is not virtuous, that, that monastic like has a lot of wisdom, that monastic has no, no wisdom, or that monastic is a street mentor, the other monastic is um, uh, whatever, a non-returner as well, et cetera, et cetera, and so forth. And he, it doesn't matter, he gives the same food, the same offering to everyone. And then uh, when he encounters uh, a monastic, um, when they, uh, come to him, um, he will listen to a Dhamma talk. So 
basically, even if the monastic is not enlightened, <laughs> even the, the monastic actually has levels of awakening lesser, less than a stream and uh, than a not returner, so less than him. And even if they don't have actually any level of awakening, he first listens to the monastic if they have anything to say. And then if the monastic doesn't give them a Dhamma talk, then he shares a Dhamma talk with them, to them. So he declares that as a, an incredible, wonderful quality. And the Buddha is like, yes, yes, those are really great, wonderful qualities. So we kind of get an idea of what the attitude is. Um, and it's not, once again, for what we were saying earlier, praise, honor, gain, <laughs> because they're bitter, vile, obstructive to awakening. But rather, we see that actually making progress in the path um, increases humility, increases um, appreciation uh, also for the monastic form, even if we, we don't hold that form. Hmm. I would also add to that, that for anyone who wants to teach the Dhamma, it's necessary to first have a thorough understanding of the Dhamma. So uh, again, this applies also to monastics, but especially to lay people. Uh, make sure you really understand what you're talking about. Um, there's a lot of people in the world these days who say they're teaching Buddhism, but they're really not teaching Buddhism. They're just spreading misinformation or they're spreading their own ideas or they're spreading some chaotic jumbled mess of bits and pieces from many different sources. Uh, so first make sure you really know the Dhamma um, and you really thoroughly understand it and that you actually have something valuable to share with others. Uh, so the ability to teach Dhamma depends upon the level of one's understanding of Dhamma. Uh, and Anonymous says, an arahant doesn't get bothered by the cold or the heat, but could they still enjoy a heated blanket on a cold night? <laughs> what do you think? Hmm. Sure, they just wouldn't get attached to it. Um, essentially one obsessed with it. And if they don't have a heated blanket on a cold night or a blanket at all, <laughs> they would still be okay. Um, so actually that's also what the Buddha says in one of the, I can't remember which sutta, um, but he was like, what are the most fantastic, you know, traits of um, the Dhamma that I teach, you know? And he was like, you know, if people just judge me by my asceticism or <laughs> actually, you know, a lot of times you can see me eating like incredibly tasty, good food um, and sleeping in incredibly great places because I'm being invited, you know, the Buddha. Uh, so everybody invites me in like fantastic places. Um, but rather it's how one um, is um, using these things. This being said, a lot of times these teachings are abused and, um, you know, unenlightened people then start playing like the Buddha. <laughs> but actually they're craving a lot of, um, I mean, they're creating a lot of attachment and a lot of um, unwholesome thoughts and uh, of greed, hatred and delusion towards all these like sort of sensual pleasures. But this being said, you know, it's there are certain things that actually the body we need to start differentiate what is a pleasant feeling that we attach to and what is a physical pleasant feeling that um, is just simply a natural reaction of the body uh, to tell us that this is a condition that is conducive to keeping the body healthy. Um, so for example, certain type of food is actually um, really tasty and it's good because actually our body is programmed to differentiate um, good food from good food in the sense that it's nutritionally good for us from food that is spoiled. And obviously we're also conditioned to have a pleasant sensation uh, with a warm blanket when it's cold than to, um, you know, have zero sensations because then we would be, you know, just in a bikini in the, the frozen Arctic and then the body would have, um, wouldn't last that long. <laughs> so it's just kind of understanding these conditions. So a fully enlightened being is my understanding that they, they have an experiential understanding of how things are. And so that's why they also don't attach um, to one particular conditioning, condition, also understanding that that condition is impermanent. 
And Samrit has a question, and I actually don't quite understand this question. Seeing our own defilements at times creates more anxiety in me that others can, out of their defilements, and perform acts or take decisions that are unwholesome or not mm. in my favor. How to deal with this? I don't do you understand what he's asking. I think so. Um, I think, yeah, if, like, for example, someone starts uh, spreading bad rumors about him or, like, doing unwholesome acts of sorts, make decisions that are going to harm you, um, either physically or mentally, your reputation or your just day-to-day -day life, is my understanding. And there is actually a sutta <laughs> where the Buddha uh, pretty much goes through all of these different hypotheses, ideas that the mind can produce of anxiety, like, oh, you know, they said those things um, towards me and now they're spreading all these rumors to um, all the people that, you know, are my friends and then my friends are not going to like me anymore and da -da -da, like how the mind can kind of go into all of these different realms. And he's like, well, what can I do about it? Nothing. <laughs> so kind of bringing up this constantly this question, is there something that I can do about it? Well, if there is something that we can do about it, we do it. If not, well, What can I do about it? Just accept it. Okay, well, everybody's going to spread a bad rumor about me. What can I do about it? This is also actually a good, uh, another um, sutta that I bring back uh, to go, I think, to Cindy's question from before. Another way through overcoming the obstacles in the path is actually that. Like remembering, well, is there something really that I can do about it? If I can do about something, then I do it. If not, well... It's a big deal. Yeah. I mean, might be a big deal, but you'll endure the big deal. <laughs> it's not much else. Okay. And Rick, clarifying his earlier question, he says, the craving is spending more money than is wise, causing debt. Mm -hmm. I typically live skillfully, but at times I feel driven to acquire more food, clothes, or supplies than I can afford. Well, uh, first off, just when you do feel the urge to spend money unnecessarily, uh, remind yourself of the fact that you're going to cause yourself difficulty in the future, that you'll be accumulating debt, which will later on be uh, difficult for you to pay off. Uh, and also ask yourself what's really necessary. So uh, I think yesterday I gave a talk on, on downsizing. And, and the point here was to start by really asking yourself, what do I actually need? Are my actual needs being fulfilled? And everything beyond that is extra. So evaluate your clothes. Do you have the clothes that you need? Then everything else is extra and therefore unnecessary. Uh, so, and the same with, with anything else that you're inclined to buy. Ask yourself, do I really need this? And you'll find that often the answer is no. You don't need it. Well, in that case, don't buy it. And also, uh, again, evaluate what conditions bring up this craving the most strongly and try to avoid those conditions. Uh, so whether it's, um, do people go to shopping malls anymore? Do those, are they still a thing? I don't know. I never want them. Okay. Uh, well, if, for example, don't go to shopping malls. Stay away. Uh, also avoid going to shopping websites um, unless there's something very specific that you're after. Um, if there's conditions where the craving comes up, like when you're feeling lonely or bored or, or whatever, then uh, again, try to avoid getting into those conditions um, or direct the mind towards more wholesome things uh, when you're faced with those conditions. These are a few general recommendations. And one thing if I may add, actually, that comes to mind is that, you know, this is a habit, right? Because you have created this habit in the mind of accumulation equals happiness, which is why then you overspend. Um, and that's because um, when we see the mind, of course, you know, if I really want this thing, um, apple cider vinegar, when <laughs> I get it, I'm happy. So then I want more. And I'm like, oh, if I have like the kitchen full of apple cider vinegar, then I'm going to be happy. And then I have it. And I'm like, oh, well, probably clearly I need more because <laughs> I'm still not happy. So we created that that habit, right? Um, so instead, what we want to do is, well, first of all, understand that process that actually when we got the whatever, the object of desire, we think that the object made us happy. But in reality, it's 
the fact that we let go of the desire of the object for that moment that we're happy, that's first and foremost an insight, a little vipassana right there, actually a big vipassana right there. And then we want to be smart and play around with our defilements, like turn our defilements, create new habits and go, okay, how about I create a new thing? So instead of accumulating apple cider vinegar, maybe I can go, hey, Bonte, would you like this apple cider vinegar that I bought? <laughs> well, maybe this is, not, you might like the water better. <laughs> this was a bad example for, <laughs> for Bonte. But you can find actually someone who appreciates whatever we have currently. And we start creating the habit of letting go of whatever we currently have. So food, um, clothes, and supplies, uh, giving it to people. This can actually be a very, when I had to get rid of my stuff um, before ordination, it was kind of a nightmare. Part of it was easy, like my Chanel bags, that was a really easy way to give it to my friends <laughs> and they were extremely happy but for example some of my art books like people were completely I was at loss to who to give it to because they had a lot of meaning for me but actually zero meaning for others which was also quite insightful because then I was like oh for them it's just a piece of junk as opposed to me it's like this precious like book and I was like so happy like ha ah. and the reaction was kind of like Bantu with the apple cider vinegar like no thank you <laughs> you can keep it but that can keep you like very busy and finding the right person who will appreciate the gift so replacing accumulation with gifting is actually something, it's a really nice habit that is more conducive to a wholesome happiness. And it can keep you very, very busy, you know? <laughs> yeah, so then when, when you do get uh, into the, the mood of buying things, then you might start thinking like, well, what can I get as a gift for somebody else? So it also shifts it from a self-centered action to an other-centered action. Yeah. And Anthony asks, when one is observing one's thoughts and emotions, how does one avoid repressing them? I often find myself thinking about the thoughts, feelings I observe and occasionally trying to counteract them. Do you want to answer this? Yeah, sometimes we are a little bit too much in a hurry, aren't we? <laughs> so I observe uh, the thoughts and feelings and then trying to counteract them, occasionally trying to counteract them. Well, let's see if it's a little bit too um, too soon, right? Because <laughs> maybe we don't know actually what we're looking at first. So I think we answered, I answered a similar question from a friend from Australia last monk chat, but in short, essentially the practice, at first we want to understand what type of emotions um, we're experiencing in the mind. So it, that's no different than um, learning, observing, um, you know, a vegetable garden. If we want to grow tomatoes and uh, oranges, I don't know, um, then we need to first understand in that land what is currently growing. Are there already tomatoes or are there a different type of plant? Uh, what does the tomato look like when it's sprouting? Is it different? Um, it's definitely different from, I don't know, say chicory that is um, sprouting. But at the very beginning, we just see sprouts. So we might actually like start plucking the tomato and let the chicory um, uh, grow and vice versa. So we want to get a little bit familiar with the with the process, how basically plants are are growing, etc. And at the same time, we're learning the manual of botany. So we we understand also how to identify things. So that's, that would be basically reading the suttas, uh, listening to Dhamma talks, etc., And then understanding, oh, this is what I'm currently looking at, dealing with. And then from there, we start observing the three characteristics of these emotions that come into being. So anicca, dukkha, anatta. And start a little bit putting some distance between ourselves and our emotional experience and understand that everything is dependently arisen and it's not who we are. And then from there, because we have understood the causes and conditions, when this comes into being, this comes into being with the arising of this, this arises of the, or with the cessation of this, this ceases, then we can start creating those conditions 
because we want a wholesome emotion, right? Um, and that's that's the time basically when we're not repressing, but we are skillfully pr- putting new causes that will create new um, new effects in the future. And we're not repressing the effects that have done and have happened in the past because we understand that the repression of those effects essentially is a new cause that makes those effects even larger, even bigger. So I was trying to do long story short, but actually, I mean, long story extra long. <laughs> That's a good answer. That's good. And Alex asks, what are some chants that we can incorporate into practice? Well, it depends on whether or not you're doing any chanting already. So for someone who's looking for a, a routine of chanting to start with, I, I would recommend the uh, recollection of the triple gem. Um, so the Itipi Sao Bhagava, Arahang Sama, Sambuddho, etc. Uh, the qualities of Buddha, Dhamma, and Sangha. Uh, the uh, three refuges, Budong, Sarna, Gachami, etc. Uh, five precepts. Um, so that's a pretty good basic to do every day as a lay person. You can also chant some other short suttas. I see Robert suggested the five subjects for frequent recollection. That's quite a good one. That's also good. Um, I'm personally a big fan of the Dhamma Niyamata Sutta, uh, something we chant often here at the monastery. Uh, yeah, and, and basically, as you just as you read through the suttas, because you are reading through the suttas, of course, you'll come across a few short suttas that you really like. So keep note of those, and you can chant those. You can put the make your own um, chanting book of chants that you like to do from the suttas. And Seth asks, if someone was interested in pursuing monastic life in America, how would one go about that? (laughs) By going and living in a monastery for a period of time. That's the only way that you're actually going to understand whether or not you actually even are contemplating seriously the idea of becoming a monastic. Uh, Some people actually, as soon as they start, they come here, you know, we all have all sorts of ideas of what being a monk is. And a lot of people are like, yes, I want to ordain. Actually, so many that I've met now. (laughs) The very beginning, I was believing each one of them. (laughs) And then I was a little bit shocked when they would like disappear, for example, come and do a residency. And then like, wow, this is an infernal nightmare. (laughs) Just leave. (laughs) Like, how can you... Yeah, not have, for example, any entertainment, TV, or all sorts of things that people have. Um, yeah, so that can that's a quick way to, to understand that. Or maybe the opposite. You know, I remember when I went to Bhavana Society, uh, or actually also Santa Chitarama in Italy, I was like, oh, wow, this is so great. I'm having a really good time. <laughs> I'm loving it. And then, in fact even though I was actually not interested in monastic life, look what happened. (laughs) And Sud asks, did the Brahman and the Uriya Sutta gain any of the realizations of the four Arya? It's not mentioned in the Sutta, so uh, we don't know from that Sutta. Um, It might, if it's, I don't know if it's mentioned in any other Sutta, the the character of the Brahman Uriya is not particularly significant or uh, recurrent in the Pali Canon. Uh, And Jojo says, I remember a lay Buddhist teacher who I believe would charge money. That is not allowed either, right? Mm, Well, I would say that there's not one lay Buddhist teacher that charges money. There's quite a lot in the United States anyway. Um, I think it's not allowed, but I would say that it's definitely not in line with Dhamma um, for different reasons. You know, uh, generosity actually is an incredible practice um, that needs certain conditions in order to be developed. Um, and yeah, the reason why we don't charge in, um, in Theravada Buddhism is to create those conditions for people to just give without there being a sort of um, ask or like, oh, there's this membership today, special only today, you're going to have money is 30% off, you know, like whatever it is that motivates normally people to 
um, to do these things, like that transactional mentality, like, uh, okay, you give me this and I'll give you this. But instead, um, what we want to do is to both give the Dhamma without going like, oh, Bunisa, she, you know, like gave this amount of money. So I'm going to give the teachings to Bunisa, but hey, Tom right there, he never like donates anything. So I'm not going to talk to him. <laughs> and that person uh, donates a little bit. So actually donates, gives, like pays that much money. So maybe if I have time, I'll do it. Yeah, we wouldn't. We don't want to have that transactional mentality if we're giving the dhamma, and also if we're receiving the dhamma, you know, um, we it's very it's very easy like to just go okay, this costs, you know, it's no different than purchasing a water bottle. I don't know even know how it costs like one dollar. Then you're like okay, this is one dollar. Do you have one dollar? Okay, I take this and I buy it, and that's it. But instead, when there is just water given to you over and over and over again, then you want to support those conditions that give you water. That is such a vital, you know, thing in the world. <laughs> so that's more wholesome, I would say. And Kumu asks, in the five hindrances, is restlessness kukucha or is it udacha? Could you please explain these two terms? So uh, it's actually a compound, udacha kukucha. Uh, which is usually taken as a, uh, a list compound. So there's different kinds of compound words in Pali. Uh, and one of the kinds is, is a list where it's just uh, two or more items stuck together. So uh, udacha means restlessness or agitation. And kukucha means regret or worry or anxiety. So I usually think of the, that particular hindrance as being um, restlessness and anxiety. That's usually how I relate to it. And these are related because uh, anxiety is this constant, restless, agitated state of mind, this constant feeling of uh, wrongness, that something's wrong and we need to figure out what it is or we need to keep rolling around in it. So it's this, yeah, this restless, agitated, uh, anxious state of mind. You can also have just that one since. Okay. So carrying on on the five hindrances, Robert says, another hindrance is commonly translated as sloth and torpor, but this feels like a holdover from early translations of the text. What would be a better translation? Um, so the Pali is Tina Midda. Uh, so I usually think of it as dullness and drowsiness, which is a slightly different approach. So dullness in the sense of um, when your mind is, is just kind of muddy, murky, hazy, unclear. Um, so kind of like when you're, you're kind of blurred out. Um, and the opposite is when your mindfulness is very sharp and intense and clear. Uh, and similarly, drowsiness is when you're just like really nodding off and falling asleep and having a hard time staying awake and staying present. Uh, so that's how I, I usually think of it, dullness and drowsiness. And Nico asked two questions, and I, I think these are just different phrasings of the same question. Um, so maybe yeah. we can just take the second one. So Nico asks, can a Buddhist be atheist and an atheist become Buddhist? What do you think? Well, definitely an atheist can become Buddhist. <laughs> can a Buddhist be an atheist? Um, um, it depends on what you mean by atheist. I would say that atheist, meaning one does not believe that there is a God creator, then definitely then a Buddhist would be actually an atheist by definition. Um, but if you take atheist as meaning that there is no... Um, no sort of gods, no other world, etc. Um, then that's wrong view. So that's, I mean, it all depends on what you mean or you define as Buddhist. This, this name can be like <laughs> a lot of people that not necessarily correspond to this definition or other, you know, more. Uh, canonical definitions will still use the term Buddhist and 
they feel comfortable with it. But Buddhist in terms of early Buddhist, maybe, um, definitely traditional Buddhist, maybe, is not, it cannot be atheist in that sense. Makes no sense. Yeah, makes no sense. Okay, and Celestino uh, asks, is any defilement linked to routine or getting used to routine? In the same way as routine is linked to holy life and to keeping a righteous mind. I don't quite understand. Is any defilement linked to routine? Do you get this? Is any defilement linked to routine or getting used to routine in the same way as routine is linked to holy life and to keeping a righteous mind? My, I think he's talking about habits like routine as in habits. So doing something mm. over and over again. Yeah, well, in that sense, uh, well, first off, often our habits are unexamined. They're just things that we've gotten used to doing and we just keep doing them because we just think that's what I do. So in that sense, it's it's usually related to delusion. Uh, so the the delusion of, of thinking that we just need to keep doing whatever we've been doing or connected to self-identity. Like I am the person who gets up in the morning and, and drinks coffee. Well, are you? Is that who you are? Or is that just something that you're used to doing? Uh, so it can be connected to self-identity or to delusion or, or sometimes just to a lack of self-awareness. Um, often we, we just keep doing the same things over and over again because we're not really paying attention to ourselves. We're not really paying attention to our own mind, not really paying attention to the choices that we're making. And when we're not paying attention, then we tend to just go on autopilot. Uh, so trying to live your life with full awareness of the choices you're making and really consciously trying to make the most appropriate and wise decisions, uh, which are not necessarily going to be your habitual tendencies. Uh, and uh, another thing that we do in Buddhism is to actively cultivate wholesome habits. So for example, here at the monastery, every morning at 5.30, we uh, come together and we do chanting and meditation together. So that's a routine, it's a habit, and it's a very wholesome habit, a wholesome routine that helps to support the development of a, a wholesome mind, a spiritual life. So routines are not inherently bad, but they're something that we need to examine. Uh, we need to use wisely in a wholesome way. And also that we need to recognize that habits and routines are not necessarily inherently good things. For example, there's nothing inherently powerful about 5.30 a.m. Um, it just happens to be the time that makes the most sense in the monastery schedule. Um, but under other circumstances, you might meditate at 5.15 or you might meditate at seven o'clock. It's not, it's not that one time is the right time, um, but rather that under certain conditions, uh, it might be the right time. So cultivating a flexibility and remembering that ultimately the purpose is always to develop wholesome mind states. And sometimes uh, routines are helpful to that and sometimes routines are, are unhelpful or even counterproductive. And summary it says, what if one has no choice but to face cunning and shrewd people to fulfill one's need? For example, buying a car for daily routine and the mind is not strong yet to face their toxicity with no reaction. What do you think? Well, uh, sounds a little bit like an excuse that the mind is not strong yet to face their toxicity with no reaction in the way that I feel like sometimes we create a lot of different excuses for ourselves. Um, but if you really think that this is the case, so, well, then ask for help ask for friends. Uh, everybody has a really like nice chilled friend <laughs> that can help them and go with them and to buy the car. And uh, we can ask them, okay, can you like interact with this person or we can buy it online or there are other ways through which we can um, prevent ourselves from being in touch, being exposed to, to conditions that trigger our three fires. So we want to protect our mind. Otherwise, our mind is never going to be strong yet or ever. You know, actually, it's going to be weaker and weaker and weaker because essentially we just keep on practicing the same, um, the same things. We keep on practicing impatience. We're, going to, we're keeping on practicing harsh speech. We keep on practicing um, anger. 
But also we keep on practicing these things because we don't understand how harmful they are. So the Buddha always talks about um, these that we need to understand also the gratification, the danger and the escape. So maybe we understand a little bit the danger, but are we actually even understanding the gratification, understanding that whenever we have our righteous indignation or we have our, you know, like, mm, we talk about other people that are toxic, but then we actually are toxic ourselves. There is, that's the honey tip of the poison root. Like there is a gratification there. We think we're right, but actually we're no different than the person in front of us because we're both toxic. So it's important to understand that, take acknowledge of it and throw it out, toss it out instead of keeping on chasing it and doing the same thing, the pattern over and over again. So let go of your righteousness and go, okay, well, <laughs> I'm just gonna, yeah, practice right speech. I'm going to, maybe I'll be silent and I'll ask my friends to speak for me. And Cindy says, when you buy things, you're really just renting them for an unspecified amount of time. Sadhu. That is right view. And Ishanti says, can you please explain the meaning of Vibhava Tanha? Yeah, so uh, tanha is craving, uh, thirst, so very strong desire. And vibhava, uh, so the word bhava means becoming or being or existence. And the prefix vi, in this case, means to separate from. So vibhava tanha is the craving to um, separate oneself from a state of existence or a state of being. Uh, and this can either be specific like the craving to avoid specific states of being um, or universal, like the craving to cease existing entirely, the craving for non-existence. And Jojo has a quote from the suttas, um, says, I understand right view is seeing the Four Noble Truths. In addition to this, the Buddha has said, how is right view the forerunner? One discerns wrong view is wrong view and right view is right view. This is one's right view and what is wrong view. Basically, it goes on to say there is mother and father, there is this world and the next, etc. Is this view also needed to have right view? Yes. Um, yeah, so uh, acknowledging there is mother and father, um, this means recognizing the debt of gratitude we have towards our parents. Um, there is this world and the next. Yeah, it means acknowledging that there are heaven realms and hell realms. There are other universes, other worlds. Um, there is karma and rebirth. These are all critical elements of right view. Yeah, definitely. And Sheehan asks, um, are you able to visit your families as monastics? What are the rules around this? Mm -hmm. Yes, we're able to visit our families as monastics. Um, what are the rules surrounding this? I can't think of any specific rule in particular. With in the venue? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, there's nothing. Yeah. Families, but yeah, that's more in Catholicism. I think it's, um, it's more widespread that the monastics go in a monastery and then throw out the key and like never see their family again. Um, but that's not the case in Buddhism. Yeah, so it's uh, some monasteries will have specific guidelines. So the monastery where I was trained, there was a, it wasn't really a, a strict rule, but there was a general guideline um, of maximum once a year. Uh, and if your family wants to see you more often, then they can come and visit you at the monastery as often as they like. So there's actually one monk there who, his mother would come to the monastery four or five times a year. And she would come and she would stay for a week or so each time. Uh, and she also would always bring lots of candies and treats for all the monks. So uh, everyone was, was always happy when his mom came to visit. Um, but that's just at that particular monastery. It, it varies from place to place. But in terms of the, the vinya, there's no specific limits. You can visit your family as much as you like. And Rick has a question. During a red kasina meditation, PT and sukha was strong. 
Then I entered a place of stable equanimity. For over five minutes after I came out of meditation, intense waves of energy and joy repeatedly moved up and then back down the body. Can you share some reflections on this experience? I do not teach casino meditation, and I actually don't know any monastics who do. So it's very rare uh, in the Buddhist world. Uh, there are very, very few teachers who teach casino meditation. Uh, and the main reason for this is because it's a practice which is very dangerous if you don't have the guidance of the teacher. Um, so most of the meditation practices that we have in, in Theravada Buddhism are quite safe, quite harmless. Uh, but the casino practices are something to be done with extreme caution. Uh, at least this is how I've always been taught. Um, so I cannot give you advice on casino meditation. And if you want advice on it, then you need to find a, a qualified teacher. And I can't recommend one because I don't know one. Um, for virtually any other meditation method, I can recommend teachers, but not for casino practices. Sorry. They're very popular in Pawak. Casino in Pawak? Oh, I had yeah. no idea. Yeah, I know mm -hmm. Pawak um monastics monastics who have trained in Pawak usually is um, it like later on in the curriculum they remember the... but yeah they do it's relatively common okay because his his introductory level stuff he only teaches mindfulness and breathing mm -hmm. and the four elements and it's only after you graduate past a certain point that they start teaching other things sure but i know some monastics who have trained with um with them who teach that. Okay. And Mary asks, are you allowed to come to a gymnasium to simply swim or work out, not for sensual pleasure, just to stay in shape? I mean, technically, yes. Um, well, I mean, I don't know about the stay in shape. Uh, we would be, technically, we would be uh, allowed uh, for health reasons. So staying in shape might be a health reason, but usually it's more of a vanity thing. So for a vanity thing, no. Uh, for a health reason, I mean, it has to be a really good health reason, I would say. Um, like that the doctor tells you, okay, you have to go to the swim, to the gym and swim. Or you have to swim and the gym is the only place that you can go to. Uh, things like that. Um, otherwise, not really it's just not terribly appropriate <laughs> i would say um yeah well also we're not supposed to look good in that sense <laughs> um so yeah that would be my thoughts i don't know if Mate, you have other yeah it's about right yeah and Sud asks, do you think if one does all one's activities with metta, though difficult to do, and sits down to meditate, despite not being a monk, can they achieve metta cheto vimutti? It's possible. Yeah, it's possible. Uh, if you do a lot of meditation practice and you also maintain metta all day long, then yeah, you can immerse the mind in metta. Yeah, it can be done. Yeah. And Chilisino says, do you want to talk on this one? Then right routine is to replace unwholesome habits with wholesome ones, keeping mindful awareness in each thing we do and to any thought coming in the mind in order to use right discernment in the Dhamma. Yeah, sounds about right. Oh, and apparently um, Ajahn Sonam gave a retreat on casino meditation as well as monastics in the in Australia. Great. Okay. So awesome. yeah, it's there apparently there's a few out there that you can contact. Yeah. Great. I do not know, but well, there you go. You can go to all these monastics for your casino questions. Great. Yeah. Neither of us are casino practitioners. So. Um, and that's the last of the questions. Uh, so if there's no other questions, then we might be bringing things to a close. Looks like that might be it for this evening. All right.
Uh, so uh, we'll go ahead and, and end at this time. If you're in the area of the monastery, you're welcome to come uh, join us for uh, meditation this weekend. Uh, otherwise, uh, keep checking in for our regular ongoing live streams and, and we'll see you next week. Actually, uh, yes, tomorrow at 6 p.m. we will have our first um, Saturday meditation of the season. Uh, so from 6 p.m. to 7.30 p.m. Um, and then on Sunday, we'll have the usual um, the usual schedule that, that you're welcome to attend. Mm -hmm. Oh, and Sud says, wait, one more question. All right. We'll wait for Sud just uh, for a little bit. Mm -hmm. But it's good to see all of our, our friends that tuned in. Sud included, but also Jason, Vivian, Kumo, Mary, Charles Lee, Tinuri, maybe she's still uh, online. <laughs> and okay, so actually Sud asked, can lay people come visit on a weekdays just for quiet personal meditation? Um, it is possible. Um, contact us ahead of time because um, often we have our own things going on on the weekdays, which are not necessarily public knowledge. So yes, you are welcome to come and practice with us. Just contact us ahead of time. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Okay. And, right. and of course, you're always welcome to come in the ground on the grounds to meditate. Mm -hmm. That doesn't require anything in advance. But if you want to come inside in the building or meet with us, it's good. We're a small community, so it's good to write ahead of time because there's always different things. Um, happening. Cindy says, oh yeah, write the book. I don't know about that. <laughs> um, well, actually, Cindy, many people keep telling her to write a book. So I'm going to join the club. Aya, you should write a book. Okay. Well, we'll see. <laughs> so one of these days it might happen. So we'll go ahead and, and end the session with three sadhus. Sadhu. 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 See you all next time.